Welcome to the Bose 3 podcast. Here is your host fresh off the campaign trail, John Bose. There we go. Hey everyone, John Bose here. First time trying this out. A uh, little bit of a bumpy start. Sorry about that. I'm going to move over to Steve a little bit. This is Steve, uh, Darcy. Steve, say hello. Welcome everyone to the first uh, Bose podcast. We will see how it goes. Um, right now, uh, we have about 30 vo- viewers on, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, what we're going to talk today about is voter engagement. Uh, and Steve, slide that way. Sure. <clears throat> so we have our fake Christmas tree in back, uh, and we have lights going and everything. So, Steve, we met, uh, what year? 2000... 2012, I think. 2012, you were doing stuff for Jim Cantwell, our state rep. Uh, and then that year you started the intern program for us, you and uh, Sean Costello, right? Um, and that was one of the most successful intern programs I think we've ever seen. Um, Want to give everyone a rundown on what that was all about? Sure. So basically, um, you know, Jim uh, got a lot of notoriety with the state party for the number of doors and phone calls he was able to kind of hit and make in the course of that campaign. And one of the reasons for that was because of how many interns we had, uh, you know, working and helping Jim out that summer. So, you know, basically the way it started was I was an intern for Jim at the State House, was looking for a little bit more work and a little bit busier. So Mm -hmm. he mentioned his, you know, re-election campaign that there'd be some more action going on. Uh, The State House doesn't really do as much during the, you know, summer. Exactly, the summer, you know, before an election. So I thought it'd be more exciting. So uh, Jim mentioned he was looking to get some volunteers and interns and asked a couple of friends to show up and was very fortunate that we got a big crowd of friends, you know, that came to that first meeting and yeah. kept going throughout the whole summer. So I was very lucky for that. And that's kind of how it got started. So we were knocking, what was it, almost a thousand doors a weekend? Uh, something pretty crazy, yeah. And I know that one fun stat from that year was that in Marshfield and Situate, we were able to make more phone calls than Scott Brown's campaign, which is pretty amazing. Pretty, for, yeah. You know, for a pretty small shop. <laughs> Um, so the way it started was we decided to put together a program that would uh, encourage people to get involved uh, and what our goals were were to basically make contact with voters yeah. uh, and every contact uh, you made with a voter you'd get a point mm-hmm. uh, and then we had a bunch of different prizes right we had uh, what was the first one we had movie tickets t-shirts bumper stickers uh, and a bunch of different things and then we had a dinner at the end um, and what the intern, what would the interns basically cycle through? What would they do uh, as far as work for us? Sure. So usually on the weekends, Saturday, Sunday, 10 to 1, we're hitting doors in the district, Marshall and Situate. Then we'd come back and, you know. A giant share. pizza party. Exactly. Yeah, I think pizza was the highest uh, budget expense item um, that cycle. And usually it is for Jim because he's good about feeding his volunteers. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we'd come back, swap war stories, you know, crazy things that happen on the doors, what kind of people you see, what happens, and right. yeah, share over over pizza and soda. And then, so we'd do that, and then what would we do in the week? During the week, basically, uh, Monday through Thursday, we're in the campaign headquarters making phone calls, generally, you know, let's say maybe 5 to 8, 5 to 7.30, um, trying to reach, you know, voters and ID people through the phones. So basically, the system was set up so that we'd recruit people to come in, um, and then we'd do our canvassing and door knocking on weekends, and then weekdays we would do uh, phone calls. Um, and each time uh, somebody, a volunteer, one of the interns was able to identify uh, a supporter or a detractor, we would give them one point, and then every point you cash in for different prizes uh, throughout the summer. Uh, and then what was the incident with the bucking bull that you guys got Jim to get on? Oh, that's right. Uh, so the Situate Carnival, um, every summer, there was this mechanical bull that you could ride on. And, and you know, Jim pointed up some cash. We had a little competition and every intern, including the candidate, which probably... Not a good idea. Yeah, <laughs> that's a, that negative ad kind of writes itself. <laughs> so they got on the bull and they were riding back and forth. And we had a few videos made. Who was the one? Uh, Brendan made us videos of the... In- yeah, he was kind of like, uh, you know, recorded all this, you know, content throughout the summer. It was like a little, you know, documentarian and put a video together for the end of the year for, you know, all the events you went to and all the things that we were able to accomplish and kind of people, you know, on the phones, hitting doors, kind of in the thick of the action. Uh, and then we had a big party at the end of the year at uh, Webster Estate. Yes. So the reason we bring this up is one of the biggest things that uh, campaigns have problems with uh, is engaging uh, voters and volunteers. So getting a lot of young people involved uh, with an election is a huge deal. 
uh, because they bring energy. Yep. Um, so what are your thoughts on the overall uh, that program? Was it successful? What would you think? What was good? What was bad? Sure. You know, I would say that program was very successful. We got a ton of IDs. Um, it was crazy how many IDs that we got. Um, and generally having young people on the doors, it seems less threatening to the average person when you have like a, you know, a high school or college student coming to your door as opposed to like a middle aged person that's just they're kind of more receptive to having a conversation. Right. And people just like to see young people get involved. So it's kind of it reduces the amount of negativity when you have, you know, a young crop of volunteers on your team. So we had about maybe thirty volunteers with a core of about ten? Yeah, I think yeah, the core 10, 30, you know, throughout the campaign for sure. And then so the next thing we worked, so years later, uh, Trump wins uh, and Steve and I team up to put together the Cranberry Corner. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're not familiar with Plymouth County, which is where Marshfield, where me and Steve are from, uh, it's one of the more conservative parts of Massachusetts. Um, and as you probably remember, there was a lot of people incredibly upset with what happened. Um, so we started trying to recruit people to help other districts. We were in Nevada, where were we, Montana, um, South Carolina, was that right? I think Georgia, Georgia. as well. Um, so we basically set up phone banks uh, in our town um, and recruited people to come and get involved. Um, and what would you say is important about that, uh, engaging voters? What did we learn a lot of? Volunteers got confused easily. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we had to rewrite scripts several times, um, but we just basically put out there that we were doing these phone banks and we recruited a decent amount of people. Yeah. Um, so, what are your thoughts on that program, the Cranberry Corner program? Yeah, it was definitely a good sized crew, and I know your goal was to take people, and even if out of state phone calls aren't necessarily hugely effective for campaigns, it, you recognize that it was important to get people in the habit of volunteering and kind of capturing that energy before our next kind of election cycles were up here in Massachusetts. So it's kind of get them in the habit of volunteering, get them used to making phone calls and kind of how volunteering on campaign or campaigns works and then, you know, get them ready to go for when, you know, our elections come up here in our state. So a uh, comment from the web, apparently Steve is amazing. <laughs> and who said that? <laughs> oh, nice. Well, thank you, Brian. <laughs> All uh, right. So uh, the whole program, we I think we made like 600 calls total. Um, the way we set it up is that we went to all the town committees um, and had them ask their members, uh, and then we used social media, um, and we did a promoted post to reach out to more people. Uh, and the whole goal was to have activities that people could do uh, to get used to uh, running campaigns. Uh, because the campaigning is not easy, it's not normal. Um, activity that most people are used to. Uh, and we were doing virtual phone banks, uh, which is you would go to a location, you'd get a uh, access code and you'd be able to call in. Um, I don't think we won any races, right? No, we made a lot of races <laughs> close, John, but no, we, <laughs> no. <laughs> we didn't win. Um, so then fast forward and we start moving into um, the election cycle of 2018. Uh, and what we wanted to do is we did a, a voter survey. Uh, where we basically sent out um, a survey that would ask people their opinions and ask them to share uh, their opinions. That was actually very successful. We got uh, about 200 um, ID voters out of that uh, that were engaged um, and then came over and started volunteering. Um, what were your thoughts on that at the actual survey process where we'd send out an electronic survey? Yeah, it definitely helps to um, ID voters in any way that you can and to kind of get their views on things. And, you know, one thing I probably should mention earlier is some folks get discouraged if their ID that they obtain is a negative ID, like a five or a four. So basically in campaigns, the Democratic Party goes on a one to five scale. One, they're a strong supporter of your candidate. Two, they're leaning towards your candidate. Three, they're undecided. Four, leaning the other way. And five, strongly against your candidate with the opponent. So, you know, those fours and fives are just as valuable as ones and twos because now you know not to waste your time and resources on those voters and to kind of concentrate on your support base and turning those folks out. So the big question for campaigns is how they convert those ones and twos, people who are supporting their campaign, uh, into activists. So we took this survey and we took the people that we, were, we knew were identified as supporters uh, and we asked them what their issues were. 
Um, and then once we asked them what their issues were, we started um, basically engaging them. We gave their information to the local town committee. So we have, what's it, 27 city, it's 27 towns in Plymouth County and one city, Brockton. Uh, and we gave that information to the town committee chairs and had them reach out. Um, and then once we got that done, so we got about 300 people to take the survey and then distribute it uh, and engage them in either doing virtual phone banks and then the postcard parties started, which were interesting. Uh, there is a woman in Norwell, which I will reach out to her. I hope she'll come on and talk to her about uh, the exciting postcard parties. Um, basically what would happen is a bunch of people would get together and write postcards for candidates um, outside of our state. Uh, and they were very successful. It seemed to get a big crowd. Uh, by this point in the election cycle, um, we were starting to see our candidates, our local candidates, uh, take up and show. Uh, so this is like probably late September when we start seeing the postcard parties start show up. Um, what are your thoughts on postcard parties? Um, you know, I, I, one thing that was done on the Kearney campaign that had a pretty good yield was, you know, dear friend cards. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you have enough supporters, have each of them pick maybe 10 to 20, you know, friends of theirs, people that they know, and write to them and tell them, you know, why you're supporting, you know, the candidate that you're behind, some of the right. issues that are important to you and you think will appeal to them. And just getting something from somebody that you know, um, it tends to have like a pretty good yield and a pretty good return on investment. And it definitely goes a long way. So we took this at Plymouth County and we had a institutionalized postcard party system. Mm. Um, we sent, I think, over 5,000 postcards uh, out in Plymouth County for early voting. And we've had a huge explosion of early voting um, yeah. all over the county. Any place we did the postcard parties, we had a huge uptick um, in the uh, exciting turnout for early voting. Um, so one of the things that I think campaign should look at is doing things like this, which they're basically dear friend cards, like you said. Yep. Um, but the problem with the, it, that I see is that it's one directional. Mm -hmm. There's no feedback on that. Right. So when you send a postcard out, I think you need to follow up with a phone call mm -hmm. or some sort of positive contact to get them to make sure that you identify them as a one. What are your thoughts on feedback loops as far as with the surveys, as far as recruiting volunteers? What are your thoughts on different ways to get people engaged? Yeah, I think the follow-up is certainly important because if you're going to send a postcard out, you want to know if it if it worked or if you're sending that to a now ID'd one or two, right. or there's still a three. So follow-up's definitely important. It can kind of be hard to get people to do that sometimes. And, you know, I'm guilty of it too, whereas, you know, you don't want to feel like you're bothering people or pestering them. So it's hard to get your evolve to take that next step and do that follow-up and say, hey, did you get my dear friend card? And, you know, what would you think? See, I think that would be helpful is if they you, you get the list, then you do the follow-up. Uh, and it's just a drive-by, hey, we already reached out to you, um, and you're contacting them. Mm -hmm. um, the change, So one of the things that we did uh, towards the end of the campaign, and it didn't get much traction, which I'm hoping our next campaign will have more um, traction on it, uh, is we did digital postcards. So what we were thinking um, would be useful is if you create a image of a lawn sign, um, and then you share it on your Facebook page. Uh, and then once you share it on your Facebook page, you track the people um, that are actually responding to it, liking, sharing, commenting. Um, because one of the biggest problems that campaigns have is the fact that a like or share or comment isn't actually an ID. Mm -hmm. So what we were thinking, or what I was thinking, is that we'd create these digital postcards uh, and then we'd go in and check who is actually registered to vote. Um, and reach out to those individuals, send them an invite to pledge support. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think any tool in the bag that you can use uh, certainly helps. Um, so do you want to tell that story? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, sure. So basically many years ago, I was at a uh, Plymouth County Democratic League meeting. Meeting. And, you know, you know, John Walsh was there. For, Former chair. Yeah, totally. And so, and we had just had one volunteer who was there who spent the majority of the meeting time arguing with John Walsh about whether the campaign he was behind paid for the lawn sign for the PCDL did. And I don't know why that was a big sticking point, but one key takeaway was the phrase, you got to use all the tools in the bag. It was repeated at least five different times. And derailed the meeting. Yeah. Um, so the reason... <laughs> So the volunteer who brought that up has a very valid point. One of the things that people like to do is hold, long si hold signs at intersections. Yeah. Uh, the problem with this, and I always point this out to people, is we live in a very conservative district. 
Uh, so if you're standing on a street corner holding a sign and 10 cars drive by you, well, the first problem is that only three of those cars are actually voters, uh, meaning that they will actually vote on election day. So out of the 10 cars, three people in cars drove by you. One of those people is a Democrat. So no matter what happens, they will vote for you and probably hank, honk their horn at you. Another one of those persons is a Republican. And no matter what happens, they will not vote for you. And they probably flip you off. Uh, we've had a few of those. Yeah. And then the third person is the only person who's undecided. And let's be honest, they're probably not looking in your direction. Mm -hmm. And in our district, they're probably a Republican. So you've just reminded the enemy to vote which is a huge thing that night drives me crazy. But all the tools in the toolkit, the question is, uh, how do we engage voters? And one of the first things, the easiest way to get people involved is sign holding, right? Yeah, totally, yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on sign holding? Do you like it, hate it? We're, we're on the same page. Not a big fan of sign holding or long signs because they're both very passive forms of engagement. And they're logistical nightmares. Oh, yeah, huge pain in the ass. A lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of resources goes into putting up lawn signs. What's it, almost $3 a sign, which if you times that by what, maybe 300 signs, that's not cheap. Yeah, and that's if you get the small ones. Sometimes right. people get the plus size ones. I think those are like twice as much, six bucks. Six bucks. Yeah. And then they disappear. Oh, yeah, yep. So if some college kids get drunk, grab a bunch of lawn signs, next thing you know, you get a sign war. Halloween's always brutal on your lawn sign inventory. And there's always a nor'easter that comes through. Yep, totally. So the reason we bring these up is visibility is a huge, easy way for people to get involved. Uh, lawn signs are also a huge, easy way for people to get involved. There's no commitment whatsoever. Right. But you got to take it to the next step, right? So if somebody comes to a visibility, you need to have canvas packs at those visibilities to see if you can get them to canvas that neighborhood. Uh, if somebody takes a lawn sign, you want to reach out to them to see if they'll come to another event. Right. Um, so, lawn side's expensive, visibility's giant suck of time as far as volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, what else is there in campaigns? We've got phone calls, we've got door knocking. Yeah, so I would add, you know, people love holding signs because it's, it's generally a lot easier than the other forms of activity that you can do. You get to chat with your friends, it's pretty, pretty easy to do, so you get a lot of people who want to do that. But unfortunately, like most things in life, it's usually the most effective things you can do are also the most difficult. You know, um, so in a universe that we tend to operate in, state rep campaigns, select main school committee, the universe is so small that you could knock the door of every likely voter. Right. And, a, a, a team hitting a thousand doors a weekend can easily blow through a universe of 1,700. Oh, totally. Um, which then you're even getting to the people who are forgetful voters, uh, which is really important. Um, so we are coming to the end of our half hour. This is a first try. Uh, Steve and I hopefully will be doing some more stuff. Uh, next week I'm going to have uh, Brian Muldoon. Uh, he is a data guy, so we're going to talk about the basics of data. Um, and then uh, the week after that I'm going to have my former boss, Stacy Monaghan, uh, on and we're going to talk about the top 10 things that campaigns should be doing in 2020, I'm sorry, 2019 to get ready for 2020. Before we go, what is your favorite campaign? All right, so favorite campaign, because this one was so close and like so exhilarating, I have to say it was with the Patrick Kearney campaign for state rep this most recent cycle. I certainly learned a lot on Jim's campaign, but it was never a question of if Jim would win. It was, you know, how much would he win by? Right. So the fact that the primary was decided by 128 votes, that meant that like every second you put into it counted, like every decision you made was very important. So when it's that close and you know that all the time that you put in was totally worth it and it's so exhilarating... I'd say that one's definitely top of the list for so sure. So it's like the down to the wire. Oh, yeah. So you're running the race and you're at the finish line. And yes. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give to somebody who's thinking of getting involved with campaigns? Um, try <laughs> bringing friends along. It's really hard to volunteer if it's just you. You don't know anybody else. It's certainly a good way to meet people. But I mean. Not I met with my wife on a campaign. Really? Yeah. The Obama campaign. <laughs> That's, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, knocking doors in the summer heat is a lot more tolerable if you're with a friend. And I can say that from the beginning, when I first got involved, it made a huge difference in this last election cycle. A good friend of mine helped me on the doors a lot, and it just goes a long way. So if you have your friends with you, it's kind of like a group bonding activity too at one point. That was a big thing for us back in 2012 as all our friends were either at the end of high school, early college, college. and it was a, a chance to see each other regularly and just kind of 
it's just it's hard work too so you do kind of form a strong bond because of it and just always having friends along just is so much better so what is the most rewarding part about working on campaigns uh definitely election day when the results come in <laughs> you know the it, what was it the week, seven months of hard work comes down to one hour for exactly yeah pretty <laughs> much yeah it's both sad and you know <laughs> kind of interesting but yeah, it's yeah, it's it's such a grind on so many days that yeah, election day is basically what you're building towards. So enjoy it as much as you can. So, um, quick story about election day in Marshfield. So when I started getting involved, uh, Deval Patrick first campaign, I was working with our not rep then, but soon to become rep, uh, Jim Cantwell, and we went to the organizing meeting. Uh, and the organizers of the Deval Patrick campaign told us that Marshfield, all we had to do was get 45%. If <clears throat> we get 45%, then we'll win. And Jim, being from the area and being involved with top politics, was like, no, 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 we're going to easily break 50%. So we start working on the campaign, and we go through the summer, and we have a conversation, and Jim's like, I don't know if we're going to break 30%. He's like, it's really bad out there. Yeah. So we come to election day, and we're at the polling location and they read out the results the last hour, basically the polls close, you're waiting for them to tally everything up. Yeah. They come out with the tickets and they tell us, Deval Patrick, 46%. And me and Jim start cheering and yelling and slapping. <laughs> and the opposition, the Republicans who had won the town were like, whoa, whoa, what just happened? And they were like, oh, you gotta understand, Marshfield always goes Republican, but then Somerville, Worcester, uh, New Bedford, Fall River, Boston will come in big. Um, so in our region, we were able to keep it at 45%. We got 46. It was an awesome day. Uh, and then the following year, Barack Obama won Marshfield by one vote, uh, which is crazy. Yeah, that's wild. So these close races are awesome. Um, you also worked on the Warren campaign. Um, you were running Jim's campaign that year, right? Yes. Um, and Elizabeth Warren actually came to my house, and Chris Matthews, who I see was looking in, likes to point out that we tore down um, the porch that the future president of the United States stood <laughs> on to give a introduction speech when she kicked off her campaign. So I say the reason you should get involved in campaigns is, first of all, the camaraderie. You meet people. It's really a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And then second of all, you actually make a difference. Yeah. Like you said, one vote, two votes, 100 votes, it really plays a huge deal. So I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, I have stepped down from the Plymouth County Democratic League as the chair. Uh, now I step down as the vice chair for SSDC. What I'm going to do is take all the stuff I've learned over the years, and Steve, I hope you help me with this, uh, and put it into some coaching material. Um, so I'm going to set up a bunch of interviews with smart people, and I see a few of them have tuned in, so they're going to get some phone calls from me. Uh, and we're going to have these interviews, and then I'm going to turn it into a podcast. Uh, if you are interested, go to bose3.com slash subscribe, sign up for the email, uh, and I'd love to bounce some of these ideas off you uh, as far as uh, what we're doing. And I just want to go over, we have Brian Muldoon um, next week, uh, same time, uh, and please RSVP to that. So, whoops, hold on. We're not 100% on the mark yet. <laughs> uh, this is John Bose. Uh, I'm going to be hosting this podcast and... Steve Darcy. Uh, I want to thank you for stopping by and spending a half hour with us, and we will catch you guys later. You have been listening to the Bose 3 podcast. Show notes are available at Bose3.com. Thank you for listening, and we will see you on the campaign trail.